Welcome to The Point. I'm Marcia Kramer. Today we're getting right to the point with former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg's first week in the 2020 presidential race. Does the billionaire stand a chance entering a crowded field this late? We demanded answers for months and got action as National Grid agrees to end its gas moratorium on thousands of customers in New York. Now Governor Cuomo is going after Con Edison. And New York City becomes the first big city to outlaw the sale of flavored e-cigs. What was supposed to be a victory in the vaping epidemic has some concern over what's next. Our panel will break it down, all those talking points, later on. But first, let's get the point of view from the driver of New York City's Department of Transportation, Commissioner Polly Trottenberg. She's trying to steer the city clear of traffic deaths and revolutionize the way people get around. At the helm of the Vision Zero initiative and Green Wave bike safety plan, Trottenberg has made safety a priority. But in the fifth year of a strategy meant to bring traffic deaths to a zero level, a jarring number of 27 cyclists have been killed. So is the DOT taking a more radical approach toward reducing traffic fatalities by pedestrianizing highly congested areas? Polly, thank you very much for joining us. Let's start right now with that new traffic and pedestrian planner on Rockefeller Center for the holidays. I'm wondering, could this be a model uh, for future highly pedestrianized areas of the city going forward? It certainly could be, and thanks for having me on, and, and congrats on the show. It's very exciting. Um, Rockefeller Center during the holiday period is obviously a particularly pedestrian rich place and, and we're excited about the city's plan. We're going to be creating additional pedestrian space on Fifth Avenue, on um, 48th, 49th and 50th Street, a bit on 6th Ave, and really trying to make sure that we accommodate that crush of pedestrians that comes to see the tree and, and look at the windows and shop. We've done various pedestrian experiments in other parts of the city, and, you know, we've learned a lot of lessons. We've done things in lower Manhattan. We have our summer streets that we do every year. So the city's doing more and more of those kind of experiments. But, but since there's a move now to have more concern about pedestrians, could you see this as a model in other areas of the city that also high, have high pedestrian traffic? I, I think we certainly could. And, you know, one of the interesting statistics, for example, about the area around Rockefeller Center during the holiday, you have 20,000 pedestrians pedestrians trying to cross key corners in peak hours. That's an astonishing number of people. And we know the city can do better to accommodate them. So I guess my next question would be this. So you've been a, there's also been a lot of criticism because the fire department worries about emergency response at vehicles getting through. And also the MTA was critical about the ability for buses to get through. What is your response to that? that? I mean, look, I, I think, you know, certainly we, we, you know, we rolled the plan out and there's been a lot of discussion. You know, a lot of people are very happy about it. Some folks have raised some, some complaints, but it was really in response to what we've seen the last couple of years, and particularly last year, I, I was in those crowds myself. We had, you know, unbelievable throngs of pedestrians and, you know, sort of feeling like they were getting very penned in behind the barricades. And so I think there was a consensus we needed to do more to improve the pedestrian space. I think we're going to be still fine-tuning it. We will obviously be working closely with the MTA, FDNY, NYPD, and, you know, we'll adjust as we need to. Well, taking a page from the concerns that were voiced by the fire department going forward when we look at the streets master plan and the increase in the number of uh, protected bike lanes and also protected bus lanes, is there a concern about emergency response vehicles getting through, you know, EMS vehicles, ambulances, fire trucks who might not be able to get around some of these new pedestrian areas? So, DOT, when we plan our designs, our Vision Zero projects, our bike lane projects, our bus lane projects, we work very closely with FDNY and other sister agencies, and we always get their sign-off on things. But one of the things we have said, it's true, as we continue to build out the bike lane network, it's going to be an ongoing challenge, particularly in places where you have very large vehicles, making sure that we have the right, you know, turning radii, making sure when we build those bike lanes that sanitation can get their vehicles in to sweep them and remove the snow. So it's going to require work with our sister agencies for sure. But when you build those higher uh, cement barricades uh, to keep people, to protect people, it sometimes is difficult for the emergency vehicles to get through. For example, right near our station, there's an emergency room for St. Luke's. And I personally have seen ambulances having difficult because, difficulty because there's two lanes of traffic, and then they're often busy, and, and 
um, there's congestion and they can't get around to get to the emergency room. Have those things been taken into consideration and do you have to do a second look to see, to make sure that the response well, I mean, time is I okay? Say, we, we try and work closely with FDNY and, and EMT and generally we have seen in the city when we do these projects well, you know, look, there's always going to be traffic and, and those challenges in the city, but emergency vehicles have been able to get through response times have stayed very constant over the years. But we understand it is a, obviously a key priority as we redesign our streets to make sure we can accommodate all the things our sister agencies need. So let's turn to congestion pricing, which you know, is coming very, very quickly. A panel in the coming year is going to determine all kinds of things uh, congestion pricing-wise. First of all, the rates. What do you think is a reasonable rate to charge people coming into the central business district of New York? Well, you got to remember the the legislation as authorized in Albany requires that congestion pricing produce about a billion dollars a year in revenue for the MTA to go for the city subway and bus system, which we're very pleased about, and 20% of the funds to go to Metro North and Long Island Railroad. So the legislative need to generate that revenue is going to do a lot to drive what the toll rates will be. The, the panel obviously is going to have to take a look at do we charge different rates at different times of day? Who might be exempt? Or what's the fairest way to allocate the tolls? But the amount of revenue they have to raise has, has been fixed by the legislature. But here's the question. A lot of people say deliveries are a really big problem in New York City, adding a great deal to the congestion that we experience. Do you think that these congestion tolls should be variable so that if you insist on driving into the central business district during the day, that you should pay more than if you came in at night. You think that might be a way to control it, and what's a reasonable difference? Right, and, and, and certainly I think, again, the legislation is looking at revenue raising for the MTA, but I think certainly from the city's point of view and, and from a lot of stakeholders that we've heard, how you design a system will, that will reduce congestion is, is equally as important. And yeah, one of the things a lot of people have looked at is what you're describing as variable pricing, which is right. If you want to do your deliveries and drive in at would 2 in the morning. Would you like to see that? I, I would like to see that. If you drive in at 2 in the morning, it should cost less than if you want to drive in at 8 a.m. But what about delivery trucks? Would you like to see the fact, so a big difference between what you pay to come in during the day and what you pay to come in at night? I mean, from a, from a transportation right, point I mean, of view. Again, I think I sort of like the debate to unfold. As you probably know, we're doing a lot of work right now with the freight industry. You probably saw the New York Times article. You know, the freight industry is exploding here in New York. New Yorkers now get a million and a half packages a day. And the challenge of accommodating all those deliveries and those trucks on the street has become a growing issue for New York City, DOT, and other cities around the country. We're working closely with the freight industry, looking at a lot of different things. You know, charging different rates at different times of day on our meters. Are there ways that they can do cargo bikes or other type of delivery that have less impact than the big truck? So we're looking at a bunch of different potential ways to reduce that impact of deliveries on the streets. So you raised the idea of having um, of who should get exemptions. Now, I wonder, as an opinion, I know you're not on the panel, but as your opinion, who should get exemptions? For example, should firefighters and police officers coming in from the suburbs to work in the city get exemptions? Should teachers get exemptions? Should other New York City employees get exemptions? What are your thoughts? Right, and look, I, I, I think it's not for me to say yet who should get an exemption. I'll just point out sort of the, the challenge of the math here, because I think, again, the legislature has mandated that this congestion pricing raise a billion dollars a year. Um, and you know, to the and, and as you're asking, you don't want the rates that, that people are paying to be too high. To the extent that you start exempting people, what everybody else has to pay goes up. So, the panel is going to have to find that sweet spot. So, council members Rodriguez and Rivera are proposing, I guess you'd call it, a pedestrian and bike mayor, somebody I guess who would have. Uh, authority over the things, I guess, that the Department of Transportation does in terms of making bike policy and pedestrian policy. Do you think that having yet another layer of bureaucracy is the way the city needs to go at the present time? You know, we've just gotten the legislation and we're taking a look at it. It's, it's a big proposal. It, it does get at something that I think is, is helpful, which is, and it's a message that I've often given, and that you're sort of raising, Marsha, in the question of us building out bike lanes and bus lanes. It's not just the DOT 
you know, DOT only project. We do need to have the fire department, the police department, sanitation, MTA, often a lot of other entities involved. And I think one vision I see in the legislation is an effort to bring some more harmony to that process. You know, the debate is underway, and I think obviously we, we already have a mayor here in New York City, my boss, so. Um, and know, a deputy mayor. And, and several mm -hmm. deputy mayors and a, and a bunch of commissioners. But I think the spirit of the legislation. Uh, you know, it's certainly something that we share, which is we always know we can do a better job of the agencies coming together to try and make the city streets safer, make them more enjoyable, not only for pedestrians and cyclists, but, but motorists, bus riders, et cetera. So there's an issue that you and I have talked about a lot, bike helmets, and whether it's necessary for people who ride bikes to wear helmets. You know that there's a study from the NTSB that says bike helmets prevent serious accidents, present, prevent serious injuries. It has the time come for the city to require bike helmets for people who ride, but also the other issue of city bikes and whether people who rent city bikes should also have helmets. So here's the challenge, and as you probably know, the NTSB put out their recommendations, and it's been tremendously controversial since they've done so. It, it certainly was not met with universal acclaim. You know, certainly the city and DOT, we recommend people wear helmets. We do a lot of helmet giveaways. We, we promote helmet usage. But in the aggregate, when you look at places where they have mandated helmets, um, ridership tends to plummet. And there is a great belief out there that I share that safety in numbers is a powerful, powerful factor in safety on our roadways. And if you look at sort of the great cycling cities of the world, particularly Amsterdam and Copenhagen, they do not require helmets, and most people don't wear them. Um, you know, on the theory. But you wear a helmet. I wear, but I'm not not 100 percent. Occasionally, if I hop on a city bike and I don't have a helmet, then I won't. But why do you choose to wear a helmet? I, again, I think for me personally, I, 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 you know, I generally wear one when I can. But it's it's a different question to say if you mandate it for everyone all the time, and in cities where they've done it, you know, for example, in Seattle, they had a bike share program and they mandated helmets. It killed the bike share program. Because bike share is sort of a spontaneous activity, and most people are not always walking around with a bike helmet. So there's a lot of divergence of opinion on this, but I think from DOT's point of view, we certainly encourage and promote bike helmets. We're not saying we want to make it mandatory. What about penalties for cyclists? One of the big uh, complaints that a lot of people have, and the mayor has actually referenced this recently, is that a lot of times people who ride bikes think that they are above the law. They go through red lights. They go uh, into crosswalks. They go up the wrong a street the wrong way. There's a whole host of things. And they don't often get tickets. Do you think that that has to be part of any street's master plan? I mean, it's funny. I, you know, a lot of people compl I, I, I hear complaints from New Yorkers on a whole variety of transportation topics. A lot of complaints about cyclists, particularly people on e-bikes. A lot of complaints about people behind the wheel too. So there's complaints to go around. Um, you know, PD has been doing a fair amount of uh, cyclist enforcement. It's very unpopular and very controversial. It's, you know. Well, it's so unpopular in the biking community, correct. but it would be very popular in the driving community because a lot of people who drive feel that they're. Um, they create a danger and they're terrified that they're going to actually hit someone. Well, remember, so sometimes cyclists and motorists are one and the same. You, you can be a person who does both. And, and we're all, you know, generally most of us are pedestrians out there on the streets. I, I certainly agree, and it's always been a message of mine, we should all follow the rules on the roadways. It will keep us all safe. And, and one of the things we're trying to, one of the challenges when you cycle around the city, uh, you know, that we see, it's very hard when you're on a bike to have to constantly stop at red lights, because with a bike you start to get up momentum, it's not like a car. One of the pilots that we're starting is something we're calling the Green Wave. We start it in Brooklyn, but we're going to move to a couple of other boroughs, where we're timing traffic signals on corridors where we see vastly more cycling activity than motorists. Time the lights for the cyclists. It means they catch more green lights, and they're therefore less likely. We see higher compliance, less likely to go through a red. It sort of makes it safer for everybody. And we haven't seen that it's had a big effect on vehicle speed. So I think on key bike corridors, that's it, it's part of a way to get at some of sort of improving everybody's behavior. License plates for bikes would it make it easier for police to uh, go after the people who bike yeah, make violations. Yeah, I, I think that is, you know, in a, in a time when we're trying to encourage people to get on bikes in terms of reducing our carbon emissions and getting people to use healthy, affordable alternatives, I think the complexities of a bike licensing program just seems infeasible and would be highly unpopular. What about parking? There's some belief that we should um, make uh, eliminate on-street parking, make it uh, charge it either with a residential permit or 
meters that have surge pricing. Your feelings about it? Right. There was a community board here in, in Manhattan that sort of put out a, a you know a resolution saying we should look at sort of doing away with free residential parking. It created quite an uproar of, of you know particularly I think regular New Yorkers who feel they're paying a lot all the time in the city and, and this is one thing they wanted to keep free. Um, and I have certainly, in my time in this job, gotten heard a lot of interest in residential parking. You know, one thing, Gail Brewer, the Manhattan Borough president, just put out a really good report on residential parking. She looked at a bunch of different cities. And the devil is really in the details. You know, you, you, can, you can do residential parking permits, charge almost nothing, and issue an unlimited number of them, and then they sort of have no effect. You know, people are just as frustrated as they were before because it doesn't guarantee but don't you think this has taken space? on a more um, urgency, a bigger urgency with congestion pricing and the fear in some neighborhoods, not only in Upper Manhattan, but also in Brooklyn and Queens, that people will come and park in their neighborhoods and then take mass transit to avoid paying a congestion right. fee? Certainly, I've heard that fear. And as part of the legislation, DOT, we will be studying. We're doing a parking study. We're going to look at all those neighborhoods and a bunch of Manhattan neighborhoods, sort of a before and after. Generally, again, though, as I mentioned, some of the other cities that have done congestion pricing, like London and Stockholm, they didn't really see that. I mean, the Upper West Side is pretty parked up right now. It would be a kind of a crazy commuting strategy that you would try and drive in every day to, you know, 63rd Street and hope to find parking and get on the subway. So, you know, that, that would be somewhat irrational behavior, but we will definitely be studying it. And, and I know there is, you know, interest at the city and the state level at potentially looking at residential parking. If, if uh, you know, if the state wants the city to do that, we'll obviously be part of that discussion. But just last week, Mayor uh, de Blasio said, that he thought it was unfair to charge residents to park in their own neighborhood. He said, quote, I'm not there yet. So do you share his view, or do you think that maybe you could convince him otherwise? Well, that, that, there's, there's sort of two issues. The one is just, should we eliminate all free residential parking? I think that's what the mayor was responding to. The second is, would a particular neighborhood voluntarily want to do residential parking, where they would pay something, but they would have the opportunity to sort of have a permit that would in theory, better enable them to park in their own neighborhood. I think on the second question, he, he's been somewhat open-minded about it. Well, Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, thank you so much for joining thank us you. on The Point. We'll break down this discussion some more and get to this week's hot topics in our panel coming up after the break.